Good evening, everybody. Ah, hopefully uh, I'm catching you on a wonderful voting day, and I hope that you've all gone out to vote. Um, not too often, but hopefully early. Uh, but we're happy that you all could take time out of your evening after hard day's work and take time out to uh, get together, as we like to do twice a year, and have some good camaraderie sharing and catching up on things and wondering what's going on in the world and how the world may change in a day. Um, but it's wonderful that we do get together and have time to share ideas and also invite some pretty amazing people who are thought leaders in our community, either locally or at large. And uh, tonight is no exception. Often, we have to think about and what we do every day, and often we're challenged by situations that aren't textbook, and we have to try to figure out what to do. And we try to go to our anchor knowledge bases, and then there are other community-based online resources that we can reach out for help. But we do need a North Star guidance in some way to anchor us and sometimes they call it the standard of care. Um, and also we need to challenge settled ideas to make progress, is there's nothing more certain than change. So our guest tonight is someone that I've been, I guess from afar watching, as I shared this with Alan, and just watching uh, sort of an evolution going on. And in the process of this, um, finding a method in which to introduce new ideas, to challenge the settled ideas, and challenge the veracity of what we do to make sure the direction that we're going is the best choice in the era that we're in. And some of the work our speaker has been doing is just to that, and it seems to be at his core. And I think this is great in terms of his visit tonight to share his points of view of things with us, sort of raises the tide here in Michigan, and with that, raises all the boats. So I'm happy to introduce tonight uh, Dr. Alan Penzias, giving a little background from this, is that uh, <clears throat> currently he's surgical director of Boston IVF. He's an associate professor of OBGYN in reproductive biology at Harvard Medical School and the director of their fellowship, and really founder of their fellowship program, uh, which is phenomenal, in REI at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Harvard Medical School. He currently serves as chair of the practice committee and the embryo transfer simulator advisory panel for, the, for ASRM. He's a member of the World Health Organization Infertility Global Guidelines and Research Group and a member of the scientific committee of the updates, quote unquote, updates in infertility treatments group under the auspices of the IFFS, the International Federation of Fertility Societies. His principal research interests, as I'm introducing that idea to you this evening, are focused on quality and improving treatment outcomes through evidence-based medicine. And without further ado, Alan, please give me a hand. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. It's uh, a real privilege to be able to address you tonight in my role as the chair of the practice committee of ASRM. And I just want to get a sense, how many people here are members of the ASRM? So very good. So I work for all of you. So that's good to know that it's not just my wife. So the subtitle of the talk that I'm going to give today is essentially looking at PGTA as our foil for discussion about evidence-based medicine. So PGTA or PGS was good before it was bad, before it was good again, maybe. So I hope that clears up any misconceptions you had about the topic. And um, what I'd like to do is to tell you also that I have no disclosures to make, and we're gonna go through how these 
practice guidelines come to be? Because I know that it can be very confusing when you look and see that there's committee opinions, there's guidelines, there's guidance documents, and to really give you a sense of the machinery behind these guidelines, how they came to be, and how you can use them in your daily practice to hopefully deliver the top quality medical care that you and all of us want to do. So at the conclusion of my presentation, I hope you'll be able to uh, distinguish the difference between a committee opinion, guidance document, and a guideline, to discuss some of the challenges of guideline and document development, appreciate the transparency of the process, and then customize individual patient treatment plans incorporating ASRM evidence-based documents. When you look at the vision statement of the ASRM, and it's on the website, there are three top line things. One is that the goal of the organization is to be nationally and internationally recognized for multidisciplinary information, education, and advocacy. But also the fourth pillar is to be able to help establish what the standards are in our field and help evidence-based treatment approaches into practice. So it's really the goal on evidence-based that we will talk about tonight. And I hope that what you'll come away with is that evidence-based isn't a handcuff. It's actually something that's a tool in a box for you to use. It's not meant to be a restrictive thing, but it's meant to be something to enhance overall. And I hope that we'll get to appreciate that. So if you go to the ASRM splash page and uh, click on for professionals, what you'll see is this nice page behind me. You'll go over to where it says um, news and publications and open up where it says the practice committee documents. Now, this is a typical list and I know it's probably a little bit challenging to read and hopefully you really uh, can't see it too much. But at the bottom, it says guidelines. Those are three different documents that are produced as guidelines. The other ones are guidance documents and you'll find a couple of those and one of the guidance documents is with respect to the Zika, guidance about number of embryos to transfer, whereas a guideline would be the myomectomy for um, asymptomatic fibroids is a guideline. And then there are committee opinions, committee opinions on a variety of different topics. So you'll see that these terms are slowly coming to be coalesced because there used to be other titles, but we're trying to narrow them to just those three. The other thing you'll see is this little box up at the top so that literally anybody in the world, meaning otherwise your patients, can go to the ASRM website. They can find these guidelines, committee opinions, and guidance documents and, and download them, but they just can't print them. So if you are a member, you have the opportunity to log in. And here it says you've logged in and can both print and download them. But another question that always comes up is, well, what happens to the old documents? Because sometimes it's very helpful. If you had a favorite reference in an old guideline and that guideline goes away, where are you ever going to find that again? One of the things we added last year was on the website, if you're a member, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the list, as a member, you have access to the Archive Practice and Ethics Committee documents. So if you want to do a little historical research, that's a good place to be and another good selling point for membership. <clears throat> another thing about membership is the email blasts that you get. So how many people got an email yesterday from the ASRM at around 11.53 in the morning, 11.35 in the morning? You all got this. I know with 100% certainty, all of you got this. Check your junk filters. You know, scroll past the latest advertisement. But it all came to you. Because what we do as part of this process is we want you involved. And when I started out as a fellow, and Dr. Sharma and I were fellows together uh, quite a long time ago, it seemed that the ASRM was the old boys' network. And it really was the old boys' network. R women need not apply. And when you looked at all of the committees, you basically saw all the same names, but they were just in different orders, right? So, you know, so-and-so was the head of the practice committee, so-and-so was head of the, this other committee, but the names never really changed. One of the things, and I really give a lot of credit to, uh, to Bob Rebar and Richard Reindoller for really trying to change the culture at ASRM, 
was to be much more inclusive, to try to bring in members all the time, try to bring in new talent, fresh voices, help people get involved. And one of the things that we in practice are very excited about is the opportunity not only to try to draw you all in to become uh, members of task forces, which I'll explain in a moment, but we also want members to actually help shape the documents. So what is this email? Well, if you look at the, the text of the document in that email, it's this. And that is the ASRM Practice Committee um, document review. Every ASRM committee opinion, guidance document, and guideline goes through a very thorough review process. And one of the final stages is to send this out. So if you open your email and you find this document and you click on the link, it'll bring you to this page. This happens to be about repetitive oocyte donation. November 2nd is the date on there. The date of review will close on November 17th. So that what that will do is that will actually bring you to a PDF that is the document in its current state. And what we're asking all members to have the opportunity to do is to comment, read the document, go through it, see what we missed, see what's missing. Did we cite your favorite reference? Did we cite the paper that you wrote? Did we miss the paper that you wrote? Did something that should be there is just glaringly absent. And we actually take all of the comments that you get, we aggregate them, and then when we as a committee meet twice a year, and our next meeting is in January, we'll sit and not only go over the comments that we get back from the members of the practice committee per se, but we'll also take into account the member comments. So if you've sent in comments on previous documents, it shouldn't surprise you if you see some of the things you suggested be incorporated because in our review meeting, we actually say, hey, this is a great point. Should we address it this way? Well, this is a little bit off topic. Maybe we won't include this, but it was a good point. So your, your comments as members are really super seriously taken into account and do change the documents. So when we think about what the practice committee documents are, and we'll go through that in a moment, but what practice committee documents are not? What are they not supposed to be? Well, they're not supposed to be textbooks of medicine. So you can't take a medical student, you can't take a resident who knows nothing, give them one of the guidelines or guidance documents or committee opinions, and expect them to be able to absorb everything about the topic from that one document. It's just not meant to be that way. They're also not recipes meant to apply to every single clinical situation. So we don't expect that people will only practice this way, and in fact, there's a comment that's uh, sort of buried in, the, uh, in one of the statements that says, adherence to these clinical practice guidelines does not guarantee a successful or a specific outcome. So even if you follow evidence, it doesn't guarantee that your patient will necessarily do well. And also, the guidance documents and guidelines don't override the healthcare professional's clinical judgment and diagnosis and treatment of a specific patient. There's just no way that any one document can know all the intricate details that you and the patients that you serve know about their individual case. So we're going to talk a little bit about the PGTA because there are a couple of people in the room who have done this thing before. There's a couple of people who might offer the service. So uh, in fact, how many people here had a conversation either with a colleague or a patient about PGTA in the last month? How about in the last week? How about today? All right, so it's a very commonplace thing. So I want to go through how many people have actually read, knew that we had a committee opinion on PGTA? Anybody actually read it? All right, well, if you haven't read it, we're going to go through a little bit of it tonight. And I'm going to go through it a little bit because what I want to help you understand is kind of the methodology that we use because I think that sometimes what will happen is somebody will grab a document, They'll look at it, they'll try to find a particular situation that either they'll try to find a reference that they know and see if it was, was incorporated in the document. But then they'll say, well, it doesn't really apply to my patient, and they'll kind of blow it off and not really understand kind of the process behind the methodology of making it. So some of the important details are really in the boring section. So you'll see in that materials and methods, talks about a Medline search conducted on September 7, 2016. The time windows of studies were human studies published on or after June 1st, 2014. Largely, that was to avoid some of the literature that addressed a technology that we're no longer using, uh, the fluorescent in situ hybridization for the most part. 
There were 40 search terms that were used that included subject headers, text, and overall 735 studies were identified. 96 of those studies were incorporated into the final document. And if you look at the box on the right side of the screen, all of the search terms that were actually used, all those 40 search terms, are listed there. So if you're curious how this, site, this was constructed, you can actually repeat the search yourself, and it gives you a way of being able to be verifiable and reproducible, and again, very transparent overall. Now, a big question that I always get asked is, okay, so you came up with 735 references, but does anyone actually evaluate all 735 documents? And the answer is yes. There are people like this who exist. One of them happens to be living in Birmingham, Alabama. <clears throat> Her name is Carla Steck. She's the Practice Initiatives and Guidelines Specialist at ASRM, and she's essentially a reference librarian whose job is to construct, conduct, and cull all of this literature from these very broad searches to be able to then bring them to us in the committee. And what she does is she prepares a spreadsheet that looks much like this one here. And you can see there's a bunch of different columns here. So on the far left, we see the authors are listed, title of the paper, the journal citation, the abstract is there. And then more importantly, what Carla then does is she'll categorize each study, listing them by type, RCT, level of evidence, and um, goes through it all. So now this is kind of a, a much more shortened version just to show you what it looks like. So here's a group of RCTs at the top, meta-analysis level one, case controls level 2-2 and 2-3, and cohort levels 2-2 and 2-3. So we do have somebody who actually goes through not only studies 1 through 46, but actually goes through studies 692 through 735. Another column that's on this spreadsheet is the decision that's being made with respect to each of those papers. So for example, in these columns there, that all of those are paper studies that were excluded from consideration for a number of different reasons. In this particular case, that studies were eliminated because they were really animal studies overall. But if you have a favorite paper and you say, you know what, I really think that should have been included, and you really are very insistent about it, and you get in touch with Carla, she'll be able to tell you not only why that study, was that study uh, identified in the search, but why it was not included specifically. So all of that is there in the background. So it's a very exhaustive process. Now when we think about you know, what are the practical limitations of different guidelines? So this is the uh, ESHRI Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Guideline. It came out actually just a year ago, this month. Has anybody seen this guideline at all? Did that come across anybody's desk? So at ASRM, we were going to do our own RPL guideline. And this literally, as we were just about to form a task force, uh, this guideline came out. And the philosophy at ASRM is that we think that guidelines and guidance documents and committee opinions should be focused and accessible. They should be both long enough to be useful, but also short enough to be useful. And that ESHRI guideline is 154 pages long. It's very comprehensive. Very few people will ultimately ever read the entire document. So even though it's there, this is really like a textbook, and it becomes a little bit inaccessible. And you may lose the message just because of the fact that it's bitten off so much all in one fell swoop. When we look at our documents overall, and this is the guideline on removal of myomas in asymptomatic patients to reduce miscarriage uh, rate or improve fertility, it's a guideline. Our gu documents tend to be about five to 10 pages in length overall. Um, and some of them are based in Q&A format. So in particular for this document, one of the questions that's asked and answered is, what is the impact of lyomyomas on reproductive outcomes? Does myomectomy improve fertility outcomes for women with intramural or subserosal? Does myomectomy impact the likelihood of pregnancy loss? So again, very practical things. And sometimes the documents, the studies, that may not quite answer those questions don't get included. But the other thing that we also produce are documents that are topical and timely. So this is a, a new guideline on the role of immunotherapy and IVF. 
uh, again, it's a guideline level document produced this year. Has anybody seen this document come through? Uh, a couple of nods in the audience. And um, it addresses the different things that people use as supplements in IVF. These things are not all benign, like uh, corticosteroids and aspirin, but include some really serious things, uh, the nupogens and the IVIGs and centacrolimus. So it actually will address some of the specific compounds that either some people are using in practice or patients come in asking about, and is meant to be able to address something that's really topical and important. So a little bit of history about like where do guidelines come from? You know, what's, what's the background for all of this? Well, in 2008, uh, Congress asked the Institute of Medicine to come up with, to undertake a, a study to determine the best methods to be used for determining guidelines for clinical practice. And they developed eight standards overall that were meant to be used across all fields for developing trustworthy clinical practice guidelines. One topic is that they had to be based on systematic review of existing evidence. You can pound the evidence, you can pound the table, it doesn't matter, and it can be the loudest voice in the room, but what they really need to be is based on the evidence that exists, and that also will point out where there's knowledge gaps, which is a very important part of the guideline development process. They have to be developed by knowledgeable panels of experts, so the thought that you could take a group of very highly trained reference librarians, have them go do a literature search, and then create a guideline on a medical topic, can't happen. You need actual experts in the subject matter to be active participants in the development, because you just can't read the papers and come up with the answers. It has to consider very important patient subgroups, because we want to make sure that it's not just one section of the population that it addresses, it really needs to to uh, address people of different backgrounds, ethnicities, and other subtypes. There should be an explicit and transparent process to, mit to sort of mitigate uh, and minimize distortions and biases. And then managing conflict of interest. If you look at the literature, particularly in um, pharma uh, associated with antidepressants, there turns out to be a ton of kind of very biased studies that have been produced not much transparency, poor management of conflict of interest, where PIs on a number of studies have made hundreds of thousands of dollars without disclosure uh, from the pharma industry. So the transparency in managing conflict of interest is a very important component of it. it has to provide clear explanation of logical relationships between alternative care outcomes, provide ratings of the quality of evidence and the strength of those recommendations. So you can have good evidence, but it's kind of tepid and maybe not apply to everybody, so it's got to say that. And then also revise when new or superseding information becomes available. And with that, I'm going to go into the second part of the talk, which is ASRM guideline development, kind of an overview of the process, just to let you know exactly how, uh, how these processes come from. So the practice committee, who's on it and where do they come from? Well, there are designated members of the practice committee from a mu a multiple numbers of the sub-societies, the affiliate societies, from SART, SREI, Society for Male Reproduction Urology, SRBT, the uh, Embryologists, Society for Reproductive Surgeons, ACOG has a representative, Patient Education Committee, and then three members at large. Also, a consulting epidemiologist, the ASRM president-elect, the chief medical officer, the CEO and two ASRM staff, and the chair. So a total of 17 people on this committee. And when we look at these folks, so the chair is myself and my term uh, will go through next year. Consulting epidemiologist is a reproductive endocrinologist, Selena Calra from Penn. The president-elect is now Catherine Murkowski, an embryologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And all the members are unpaid volunteers, uh, with the exception of the permanent the staff members of ASRM, Richard Reindoller, Bill Hurd, who just became the new um, Chief Medical Officer um, last Thursday, and uh, two staff members, Jessica Goldstein and Carla Steck. If you look at the splash page, and this is, I, I looked, made this slide just the other day, in 2018, we produced 11 new documents and three guidelines, seven committee opinions, and one guidance document. And the productivity, I think, is really reflecting how the 
committee has come to do its job. Now, they say that a camel is a horse designed by a committee, so how could 17 people actually do anything? The truth is that the way that it used to be done was maybe a little bit um, tighter, but less transparent. So in the distant past, a topic would come up and say, hey, we want to produce a document, and we want to call it a guideline. Fantastic. Call it a committee opinion? Sure, we'll call it that. There was really no distinction between them. Two people from the practice committee were assigned the topic. They would go out and do the literature search. They would write the initial draft. The draft would come back to the 17 members of the practice committee who would spend a day wordsmithing the document. Not going back to check, was it a comprehensive search? Not looking to see, was there any evidence of bias? Did they have anything that they included that was contrary to the opinions of the people who were writing it? No. It was just really wordsmithing a final product. So now, things are a little bit different. <clears throat> and a guideline <clears throat> excuse me, follows a very rigorous process that's actually set out by specific standards based on the National Academy of Medicine. So to be able to reach the level to call it a guideline and to then be accepted at the National Academy of Medicine level as a guideline, there are very specific things. Committee opinions, guidance documents are also evidence-based, but don't completely qualify for the same designation. Now, why isn't it that all of the documents are guidelines? And the answer is that, you know, some of them are really not appropriate for it. For example, number of embryos to transfer. That's a guidance document. There really isn't a good way, there's not enough studies, it really isn't a topical matter that would really lend itself to being created as a guideline. So using it as a guidance document based on best available evidence, sort of best good practices, clinical practices, is the way that they go. And you know, some, some just organizationally, some documents don't really lend themselves very well to being a formal guideline, so they'd be better served. If the literature doesn't exist, for example, there really isn't enough level one evidence that would be able to contrast different modes of practice you might give it a false endorsement as a guideline when really the weight isn't there. Guidelines are very laboriously worked over and lovingly done. It's our gestations are twice as long as human gestations. <clears throat> and from the guideline, from conception to publication is about 12 to 18 months. It takes quite a while to get these things done. The topic is selected by the practice committee. And another feature on the website is there's a suggestion box, as it were, an electronic suggestion box. So if you as a member say, hey, why doesn't the practice committee have a document on this? You can actually recommend it. <clears throat> we take those at our January and July meetings, and we go through them. And sometimes that's how the documents we'll get from a member will come to be. Then we now pick a task force. And that's really an important change that's allowed the productivity to go on. So a task force is impaneled. So it's not just two people going off <clears throat> to do a literature search. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the task force has an epidemiologist on it. The chair of the practice committee is an ex officio member. But one of the members of the practice committee becomes the good shepherd or the chair of the task force. We have three to four clinicians at various levels, some with 10 or more years experience, five to 10 years, zero to five. We sometimes have fellows coming on board. We're trying to get fellows involved early in their career so they become volunteers and get used to volunteering to participate. You can volunteer through the ASRM website to say, hey, I'd like to serve some role on a committee, and I'd like to participate in the society in which I'm a member, and your name will be recorded, and you may get a call or an email saying, hey, would you like to be a member of a task force on a particular topic? We have people who are Crest scholars who've learned how to do good clinical research, and then sometimes other experts, if it's a mental health document or genetics or laboratory, who will be involved. The ASRM staff, particularly Carla, helps design and conduct the systematic literature search, and builds that master spreadsheet to identify the different types of articles, as I've shown you before. So why does it take a year to a year and a half to happen? So the task force members 
are assigned individual sections. So when the practice committee comes up with the, finalizes the topic, comes up with what questions we want to answer, the task force members are divided up and you get a particular question. The task force chair then assembles all of the sections and sends a first draft back to the practice committee. The task force chair is also helping to write it in one voice because when you have five or six authors on a document, it could sound very disjointed. So one of the tasks for the task force chair is to make sure that it reads as if one person had written it. Practice committee reviews it, provides feedback, sends a draft to the, practice, to the task force for revision. Revisions are made. Then that important public comment, and which is where we are right now, at public comment stage with the uh, repetitive oocyte donation. And then the public comments are reviewed, document edited, ultimately it goes to the ASRM Board of Directors for review. The Board of Directors provides comments, the, the PC Task Force Chair and everybody makes their final revisions, finally reviewed by the CEO and the Scientific Director, and finally it's published on the website in Fertility and Sterility. So with agility of 18 months, it's like moving the Titanic, so it's not exactly like up to date. So does, do people use up-to-date in this audience? So up-to-date is used by a lot of residents, people who are staff at hospitals. But there's many more agile sources of information. So one of the frustrations that I hear from a lot of members of ASRM is like, but you did your literature search a year ago. What about this paper? What about that? It's a trade-off. It certainly is a balance. We recognize that it's very hard to be up-to-date to the same level without a full-time professional staff vetting all of the literature constantly, but that's not really realistic with the dues that we pay. On the other hand, what you can count on is to be able to use these guidelines and documents as a place to start. Because they're not meant to be cookbooks or recipes, it's a good place to begin to understand what the foundational literature is, where the documents begin, and what kind of questions you can ask. So let's take a look at the PGTA document and we'll sort of walk through each of the different sections and then hopefully we'll have some time to go through and ask some questions and, uh, and talk about it a little bit more. So clinical outcomes in favorable prognosis patients. There were three RCTs, all with small sample sizes and several retrospective cohort studies and a meta-analysis included in the literature. The significant limitations of these RCTs was that the randomization was only for patients with good quality blastocysts. So when we're thinking about a, a great technology, is it that it only applies to those who can make it to that? Does that already skew what the answer is going to be? Good prognosis patients. Fresh embryo transfer versus current practice where many clinics will biopsy. How many people will typically grow embryos today, five, six, or even seven, biopsy and freeze, and then get a PGT result back? Before. Does anybody do biopsy day five and a transfer day six? Not many. You know, it's occasionally done, but, but the fa it doesn't come out that way. But the literature addresses some of this. <clears throat> the U.S. National ART Registry, if you look at the data from this, it suggests that for women who have, uh, there's no improvement in live birth if you apply PGTA in women age 37 or under. And there may be some improvement in women over the age of 37. So you need, according to the literature, you need 21 people to treat to accrue one extra additional live birth from PGTA. Now there may be some potential biases in benefits up to age 43 because only good prognosis patients who can get blastocysts might be eligible for some of those studies. And there's no benefit according to the literature from doing it in patients who are using donor egg. Now one benefit that is mentioned in the document and is something that does come up a lot in conversation is that if it gives patients the confidence to proceed with elective single embryo transfer, that may actually be a better benefit than putting in two embryos in a 35-year-old who's nervous. So that could justify using the technology for that. And then in recurrent pregnancy loss, when you actually look at the data that's published, First trimester pregnancy loss, largely due to aneuploidy, so sort of meets Koch's postulate. It, it makes sense that PGTA could work. The existing studies really don't show that there's very much benefit overall. Um, you're not seeing higher live birth rates. But then again, many times RPL patients really aren't infertility patients. They do get pregnant, but they have the losses. 
and we do see a, dis a distinct decrease in miscarriage rate from an average in some of the papers cited of 24% down to 7 by doing PGTA in this population. So the benefits are relatively narrow, but fairly precise. But it doesn't answer every single question. When looking at day five versus day six biopsy, there doesn't seem to be very much difference in terms of the outcomes overall. And thaw biopsy and refreeze for embryos that weren't tested previously, were tested and didn't have an outcome and get rebiopsied and tested, doesn't seem to have any uh, negative impact overall, although you may lose an embryo or two along the way. Now, how about neonatal and childhood outcomes? Because that's obviously of great concern to people. Uh, th thus far, the data is pretty reassuring. We don't have a lot that's published on children born after PGTA, but there's a lot that's of babies born from PGTM that goes back quite a ways, and that's very reassuring data. So hopefully, it's the same. Techniques were different, day three versus day five. Um, most of the time, couples in the PGTM category in the past, some of them might not have been infertile. So we can't completely overlap the two, but the data is relatively reassuring. And then cost effectiveness is another opportunity to be able to have benefit from this technology, but it's kind of hard to quantify overall because trying to qualify the cost or quantify the costs of pregnancy loss, failure, yes, sir. Ah, I'm sorry, I am remiss in not using, defining the terminology. So PGTA, uh, formerly known as PGS, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy or chromosomal abnormality, in contrast to PGTM, pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic or single gene disorders. So if you have a patient and a partner with both carriers for cystic fibrosis, they have a 25% chance of having a child affected, and you would use the technique PGTM to test the embryo to see if both alleles, mutant alleles, were inherited by that embryo. In contrast to a woman who may be 42 or 43, who merely wants to know, does that embryo have a normal complement of chromosomes 46XX or 46XY? which doesn't tell you about the single genes. The third category, PGTSR, for structural rearrangements like translocations of that nature. Sorry about that. Um, the cost. So cost is fairly hard to quantify, but there may be some opportunity to decrease the time to pregnancy and the total number of cycles or embryo transfers undergone, so there may be some benefit to spending the funds on PGT, but again, the studies don't really, aren't really out there yet to give us full data, but it's, it's a suggestion. And mosaicism. So how many people are familiar with the, how many people don't know what mosaicism is in embryos? Okay, so we have one, I will explain it to you, and then you'll explain it to everybody else. So mosaicism, just like a tile mosaic on your bathroom floor, which if you are like my wife, is almost entirely a single color, and with one exception of a very specific pattern that she insists that we must have in our bathroom that resembled a New York City subway. Now why my wife, when we did our bathroom, wanted a New York City subway appearance, I don't know, it's part of her history, don't ask, don't tell. However. Just like that tile mosaic in my bathroom floor where 90% of the tiles are white and 10% are black, that mosaic or a mosaic that you would see in a piece of art represents the cells in the body. Each, each tile is a cell. And if they all have the same chromosome complement, that would be a structurally normal complement, every cell having the same copy. A mosaic in an embryo is one where you don't have the same chromosome set in every single cell. Most cells may have 46 chromosomes, XX or XY, and some have a different type of chromosome arrangement, 45X, 47XX plus 22, an extra chromosome 22. And what we know about mosaicism is relatively little because we were probably transferring, no, we were certainly transferring, we are certainly transferring many mosaic embryos that we don't know about. 
And now with some of the technology, with the good comes the confusing. And with the process of mosaicism, different practices will choose to ask their PGTA uh, provider, the vendor, to either disclose whether they've uncovered mosaicism in an embryo biopsied or not to. And those that choose to have the declaration will then have this added piece of information to discuss with the patient, is the embryo chromosomally normal, clearly, clearly abnormal, or a mosaic? And if so, is it a low likelihood or low level mosaicism, which is of tremendous debate, where is the cutoff, or is it high level mosaicism? And what chromosome is it mosaic for? Is it mosaic for something that is lethal? So if you put that embryo in and it's effective, the worst case scenario is miscarriage, or is it something that could result in a live birth, like Down syndrome, because the mosaic was for an extra copy of chromosome 21? It adds another layer of complexity in the counseling that we all do, and the jury is still out, because we still don't really know how to handle this information, because we don't know, is it confined placental mosaicism? The embryo was developing, and it took all the abnormal cells and said, you go, hide in the placenta where you're not going to bother anyone, and you happen to sample that region, because we're not taking the sample from the area of the embryo that would become the baby? Or is it global mosaicism, where your 20% extra copy of chromosome 20 is ubiquitous throughout the whole embryo and will certainly result in a miscarriage? So the, the jury is still out here, and current data doesn't really exist to conclusively determine is there a better platform, one versus the other, in determining mosaicism and or eliminating this, uh, this, this discussion that we're having about it. One of the things that we talk about in this document are the gaps in knowledge. And it's really, gaps in knowledge is a topic we've added because it's really kind of a call to action. How many of you sit in your offices or at home or reading one of these guidelines or documents and say, you know what, this is, this is great, but it doesn't address my question. And it may not address the question, not because we don't want to, but there's a gap in knowledge. So things like cost effectiveness, if you have an interest in this topic, love to have you uh, work and put a study together, get it published, we'd love to have that in a guideline. The role and the, eff the effect of cryopreservation, time to pregnancy, patients come in, there are two types of patients that come into my office, those who are ready to be pregnant tomorrow and those who are ready to be pregnant yesterday. There's not a lot of wiggle room between those two. So if I tell her that I would like to put back one embryo for her long-term health, and it's gonna take seven months to put back one embryo each, it's a long time. That's forever. <clears throat> That's practically the length of a whole pregnancy. So time to pregnancy is a very important element that needs to be considered as well. What is the utility of PGTA or PGTM in specific subgroups? Are there some groups of people, whether it's by age or by ethnic background or by region or by some other characteristic, genetic or otherwise, that would make them more or less successful? What about cumulative pregnancy rates, the total reproductive potential per intervention? So when we think about the guidelines, they're not static. They must be reviewed by the practice committee every five years and either endorsed as being current, relevant, and topical, and now we can go on and continue to use them, or they need to be revised. If a new landmark study comes out, we're obligated to go ahead and revise it right away. <clears throat> the process is very laborious, but it is also very rewarding. So as we come to conclusion, so the benefit of these national guidelines, what are they? So to practicing physicians, really to summarize the world literature and give practical guidance to answer discrete questions or topical, of topical importance to frequently asked questions. And it's also a starting point because you can't necessarily go out and look at all 735 different papers that Carla Stick combined for us, but you can start with the guideline and say, okay, this was a very thorough review and things were included for a particularly good reason and their design is important and good. To patients, guidelines are a starting point for discussion about their treatment, 
because sometimes you just need a place to begin and patients will come in with all sorts of stuff on the internet. My favorite colleague is Dr. Google. I, I consult with her or him very frequently because my patients seem to all attend their clinic and come in with stacks of things. I don't know if it's here in Michigan, but in Massachusetts it's a very common disease. Um, and you know, it's funny when I'm sitting across from a person who's a lawyer and investment banker and they're telling me the latest literature that, was, that they want to cite that they found on Google Scholar. And you know, my comment is, I have a really complicated slide that's got a lot of acronyms on it that I pull up. I say, well, I'm just wondering if you considered uh, the, the uh, exocrine pathway of the you know, interglobus uh, distribution of uh, seminal vesicle. And uh, did that really apply to the case that you're describing? And I just throw a few words together. And it's really meant to sort of say, all right, step back. This is my territory. Now, I can have an intelligent discussion with you. I want you to be participants in your care. I want you to come away understanding, but I can't make you a reproductive endocrinologist with 30 years of experience in one conversation. And you can't do it yourself by searching the internet. But it's a good place to begin because often I will use the guidelines and say, let me diffuse what you're saying there because here's a massive amount of evidence that would actually go to the contrary of your needing to take Ginkgo and Maca and uh, CoQ10, which is my current favorite. Um, and then to society, you know, what else is it for society? It really encourages progress that's evidence-based. Um, potential for overall improvement in quality of life is why we all went into medicine, and hopefully the guidelines are a good starting point for that. So with that, I hope that you will all now go read your email, number one, and comment on that doc document because we're looking for those things. I'm taking a copy of names and I'm going to see who's actually submitted. I'm also going to use that same list to see who's volunteering. Who's going to go and find, fill out that little form and say, hey, I'd like to volunteer to be on a committee or a task force or to get involved. I want to help participate because I want to break the chain of just a limited number of people. I want this to be diffused. I want people from Michigan to be represented at the national level with the documents that are being produced and also to volunteer to uh, come up with questions. If there are things that are important to you that you want your society to address that you don't see a document, you see it three times a week in your practice or in your conversation with colleagues and say, why isn't there a document like this? It's because I'm too dumb. I didn't think of it. You know, if I would have, I would have, of course, produced that document for you. But let me know. Tell us what you want produced, and that will actually be taken into account. And with that, I will um, say thank you very much. I could not come tonight without this. But at least I didn't talk about that football team in Boston that people all hate. I don't know why. But, uh, but thank you very much for your attention. I happen to be one of those recent volunteers <laughs> uh, on a, a committee task force for egg freezing. And the thing is, I went there thinking, I have all these opinions, and, and you know, we've done our research and some original research and rah, rah, rah. And I'm finding through the dialogues how much more I'm learning by being part of a community to do that. And it is sort of addicting after a while. So. Uh, uh, that was part of my inspiration to reach out to you as well, because uh, all the work that you are doing on juggling so many levels to keep things going in such a positive way has, has, has really been a benefit in my practice, I can say, but I, also I'm sure to yours. And I want to open up the floor for questions that you may have. And um, feel free as we challenge settled ideas to challenge Dr. Penzias and saying, what do you mean PGTA is the best thing since sliced bread? And by the or way, the worst. Yes, so please. There are good questions, and then there are hard questions. And that's a hard question. So anybody else have a question? <laughs> no, so what I can, yes. So the question is, um, with respect to what is ASRM doing to get nurses more involved, and what are we doing? Why, did there, why were there no nursing um, continuing education credits for the annual meeting? I don't know the answer to the latter question. I imagine it had 
it was something administrative. I will bring that concern to Dr. Reindaller personally and Dr. Hurd, who started last Thursday. Why should he have time to rest? So I'll bring that back to them because it's very important. Um, one of the things we've always done is we've been very big supporters at our practice level in Boston of making sure our nurses are involved, participating in ASRM, going to the meeting, because it's a great opportunity to then meet their colleagues. They're a great the nursing uh, interest group has a course that they put on every year in the annual courses. So it's a great, if you're a doctor, send your nurses. If you're a nurse, ask your doctor um, or tell your doctor, not just ask, just because you actually control the power in the practice. So just say, I'm going and just say, okay, you're going uh, and take a course, participate. The nursing interest group really thrives with local participation. So I'd encourage you to volunteer and participate in that because there are nursing topics and there are nursing documents that can be produced that will address the needs of, of nurses and colleagues everywhere. So um, while I can't give you the nursing credits uh, today, I will definitely bring that concern, but the ASRM, I can tell you, is very committed. Jessica Goldstein on our task force, the, the permanent, she is a nurse, so we got your back. No, clearly, because if the, the comment is if the nurses aren't going to get credit, they're not going to go, and that would kill the society. So it's really critical, you know, one of the critical legs of which we stand. Uh, can't, can't pull that leg out. So the question is, what is the legal ramifications of the document? Does this establish a standard of care? And is this something that will either help you if you are ever involved in a lawsuit, or could it hurt you if you're ever involved in a lawsuit? The guidelines are not meant to be cookbooks of medicine, and they are also fairly particular in being having very wide latitude. So they're not meant to be the standard of care, because the standard of care is really the local community standard of care, because there's not the same resources everywhere. So to say or to pretend that one national document could determine the standard of care everywhere would be foolish. On the other hand, if you are looking, if you are, heaven forbid, ever have a patient with a problem who then decides to take the legal route and you are using a, as a support of the treatment you've provided the documents produced by the ASRM, you will be on very firm footing because they are pretty unbiased and they provide a good floor of good practice. So if somebody is a plaintiff attorney and claiming that you did a bad thing and nobody ever does this, if you have a document from the ASRM that says that this is something that's done and it's evidence-based, it's good support. If what you did is contrary to the guidelines, documentation is critical. I'm the chair of the practice committee. There are things that I do that I know my documents that I'm lead author on go against. So what I do is I make sure to document why because that's the critical question. Why is it that I deviated from what this guideline might say? And there's usually a good reason. It's either because you know, of something that was clinically relevant to that individual. So good documentation, those docu the guidelines won't harm you. And if you have a problem and you've followed the general precepts, it should help you. So, you know, we're also practitioners. You know, we're actually practice people ourselves. So it's sometimes we'll ask, the, we'll come up with a guideline topic We'll then sit down and say, okay, this is what we want to really address, and we'll come up with question you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then we get the draft back, and we're sitting in the room, and we're meeting, and we're saying, why does it say that? None of us believe that. Of course, this, that's crazy. How's, how did that, what was missed? Why is it that it's saying A when we all believe B? And it's that whole idea of settled idea. You know, we know it in our head because in the last five patients we treated, three of them did better when we did treatment X, so why is it that the literature says, nope, no value? And then how do we really digest that so that it can be understood as to why it says that? Where is the knowledge gap? What's not applicable to the general population that might be applicable to the subset that I'm treating myself? So we as ourselves sometimes will read these documents first draft and be surprised at how little the literature has in it. In fact, what we've also found, and this is why we have an epidemiologist on board, is that we found that when we go back to some of the original papers, we have actually found statistically, statistical errors in the calculation where somebody has published a paper that comes out strongly in favor of something because of statistical significance. We take the numbers from the paper, we recalculate it, and found that it's actually not statistically significant. 
and that it, it shoots the paper down. And then we've seen um, sort of these meta-analyses that are based on other meta-analyses, that are based on a previous meta-analysis that hinges on one manuscript of 50 patients. So it's like, well, okay, so we, when you sort of drill down and you have these sort of superlatives and sort of the echo effect of, oh, this is great, 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 and then you go back and says, eh, it's pretty good. And you realize that the foundation is fairly poor, so you may have good level of evidence, but the strength of recommendation may be, eh, you know, it's not that strong. And you may wonder when you read the document, like, why weren't they more positive about it? It was a P of less than 0.0001, but the strength of that recommendation was fair. That may be the answer, is that the, the, there's only two legs of a three-legged stool that we can stand on. First of all, Dr. Penzias, thank you so much for your great presentation. You I really much. appreciate it. Much appreciated. <laughs> thank you.